Yashati Putram Patra Surupam Rupam Tasakaja Muri Purim Maturim So Priya Charna King Kurim Kuru, the way was me, the way was me, Najila Mitoyamina. It's Evic Yaya Devi Tom Nama Charna Kikam. First of all, I offer my Sustang Dandavat Puspanjali. My heart like flowers thousands of times at the lotus feet of my spiritual master, my most worshipable Gurudev, Asmadeva Paramaradha Tam Guru Padma Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Par Ashtoltara Sata Sri Rupanu Gachari Vaya Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Srila Narayan Goswami Maharaj. Jai! Secondly, I offer my pranam thousands of times at the lotus feet of my Param Gurudev Srila Prabhupada and to all of our Sri Rupanuga Gaudiya Guru Parampara. Yeah. Okay. And finally, I offer my pranam to all the, my dear brothers and sisters here this evening. Vaicha Kalpa Durvasta. In Sanskrit, it is said that. When you're about to do something very auspicious, obstacles come. If you're about to do something foolish, which will spoil your life, or oh, the freeway is completely clear, no problems, and you can run into disaster without any problems. But if you want to do something positive, you want to do something good, many problems, many, many obstacles will come in the way. The most essential and foundational text of spiritual knowledge that has been studied in India for thousands of years in the Sanskrit language that is Bhagavad Gita the message of Bhagavad Gita is that we are all transcendental beings 
that this physical body is just for now momentarily a vehicle for our soul. Our soul is on a journey. We have taken birth and we grow and then just like everything else in the world, whether it's a piece of fruit or a flower, we begin to fade. We begin to lose our luster, energy, vigor. Our mental and intellectual faculties also. And then this body falls. Then the soul within, in accordance with the state of one's consciousness, Yam yam bhavismaram bhavam chadyat yanti kalevaram tam tamme vaiti kontiya satatat bhavit bhavit ha. Whatever your mind is absorbed in in the last moment of life, one will attain another body corresponding to that mood. So it's very important how we pass our time, how we spend our life. If we spend our time absorbed in worldly things, then at the last moment of life, actually even scientists have discovered that when someone is about to pass away, then just exactly at that moment, there's a huge increase of brain activity. Hmm? And it's symptomatic that that person, he's seeing his whole life flash before his eyes. And if one is seeing the complete catalog of just worldly activities, then what will happen? Then the subtle body, which accompanies the soul, the mind, the intelligence, the ego, they will carry the soul into another material situation. If you remember your dog, then <laughs> you can also take birth in the body of a dog. If a man remembers his wife, then he'll next life become a woman. If a woman remembers her husband, next life she becomes a man. Whatever the state of mind we have in the last moment, then we'll become like that. So it's very important that we pass our time, we pass our life, we invest our time and energy in spiritual activities. If every day you come to your temple room and you offer flowers and a candle and incense and bow down, to Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. If every day you are chanting the holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare, 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 Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Studying Vedic li literature like the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and associating with saintly persons who are free from all illusion, free from all attachments, free from all ignorance and bodily identification and have a full consciousness of God. If we pass our time in this way, then what will happen at the last moment? Then all of those spiritual activities will flood into our mind. And one has the opportunity to make a very big leap. Uh, it's a great opportunity for advancement. Especially at the last moment of life, then one becomes helpless. And when one becomes helpless, there's a great humility. And the advantage of humility is that humility, whatever devotion we have, humility causes it to surge. And so that, that moment which everyone is avoiding, everyone is denying and everyone fears, for those who've lived a life of devotion to God, Suddenly at that moment, they become completely helpless. They become more humble than any, ever before. And there's a, there's a great burst, a surge of devotion at that time, which will carry them. Either it will carry them to a higher destination, the next life, where they'll just be in the company of saints all the time and have no worldly entanglements. Or it may, if they have a strong sadhana and they have served their spiritual masters, and received mercy, then it will carry them beyond this world. Yad gatva nani vartante taddama parmam mama in Bhagavad Gita. So those who go to the transcendental world, they never return to this place.
So one may say, oh, you are saying that I am a soul, I am a spiritual being, but I really do feel like I am this physical body. Why is that? Why is that? Krishna Bhuli Sai Jeev Anadira Bahimuk Atayeva Maya Tari Dhyaya Sangsara Duk Our consciousness has a directionality. Just like you can turn and look towards the sun and then you can bask in the sunlight. But if you turn away from the sun, then you see your shadow. So in the same way, when our consciousness is turned towards God, there are no shadows. We live in the state of complete enlightenment. But as soon as our consciousness turns away from God, then we become covered by shadows. That is called avidya. Avidya enters our consciousness. Avidya is the experience of abhav. In Sanskrit, bhav means existence. And abhav means non-existence. Non-existence. So you can be introspective and look into the functions of your own intellect and detect the degree to which that above, that emptiness, that absence is present. It's very fascinating. Now we're going to speak a little about the psychology of Bhakti Yoga. The great saint and the guru actually of Vyasadeva, Srila Vyasadeva, who has written the Vedas, who has written Bhagavad Gita, his guru is named Narad, Narad Rishi. So he gave a teaching once. He said, Abhadita api abhaso yatha vastu taya smrtaha durgatana aindri yakam tadvat arta vikalpitam the meaning is this, if a child sees the reflection of an object or the shadow of an object on the wall, the child's intelligence is not developed yet, a small child, and seeing the shadow or the reflection on the wall, he thinks that the shadow or the reflection is a vastu, a real substance that has its own existence, it has its own independent life and existence. But when the child's intelligence begins to mature, then he recognizes that, oh, this is a reflection or a shadow, and it does not exist independently of a genuine object, the object of which it is a shadow or a reflection. So, in the same way, everything that we see around us, Durakatatvada means all the objects of the senses we see around us. They're all contingent objects. That is, they're not self-existent. They're not self-dependent. Their existence depends on other factors. And therefore, they appear for some time and they disappear. You can think of anything. Life is only growing on this earth even because the sun is shining. If the sun didn't shine, we would all freeze to death. The sun also will only shine for some time until its energy is expended and so on. So each and every object is dependent on something else. It doesn't have its own substantial foundation. So if all the things around us are contingent on something else, there must be somewhere some eternal existence upon which all these things are contingent, a non-contingent, self-existent being. Now, because our consciousness has turned away from God, then the, the consciousness becomes imbued with this avidya. Vidya means knowledge. Avidya means the opposite of knowledge. Avidya, ignorance. And that ignorance is in the form of abhav, an absence. 
And this is why, as human beings, it's our psychological tendency, we inquire into subjects. But we only inquire so far. And then our mind just does a kind of a causal closure. Oh, what's the cause of this? What's the cause of this? Oh, what's the cause of this? What's... And then we just go, oh, oh what's for lunch? <laughs> well, you can examine yourself. At the end of every one of your thought processes, there is an above. A simple empty absence. It's just like, if there's a materialist, let's say there's a materialist, doesn't believe in God. I only believe in science. Oh, well, this world, it's uh, made of atoms. And uh, oh, really, what are they made of? Oh, well, atoms are made of protons and neutrons. And, and what are they made of? Uh, bosons and all these. There are so many thousands of particles, especially you know about them here in Switzerland. <laughs> because you're in CERN, right? In CERN, you have the particle beam accelerator, where for years and years, they're trying to break the particles apart and find the last one which has been nicknamed the God Particle. <laughs> I mean, that's actually true. <laughs> but what happens is we think, well, it's um, a person says, I'm a materialist, but if you ask them, well, if you're a materialist, what is matter? No answer. No answer. Because there's a search that goes to a certain level, another level, another level, a level, then... What's for lunch? <laughs> we always end up in this above, but we don't notice it. And this is what Narad Rishi is saying here in Srimad Bhagavatam. It's necessary. A guru is necessary because we don't, we are not so uh, introspective to exactly understand the nature of our own conscious functions. But as soon as Sri Guru, the spiritual master, will point it out, then you can see that we live within a particular context. I am Swiss. And I live in Switzerland. And Switzerland is in Europe. And Europe is in the northern hemisphere. And the northern hemisphere is on the planet Earth. And the Earth is in space. And the space is in... What's for that? <laughs> Stop. It doesn't matter whether you go down into anything or you go out into anything. We live within the, con the context of a conscious, above absence hmm, of the existence. So this is called Nirvishesha Shunyavad. Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastacha Deshatarine. The foundation of all our ideas at the bottom we find emptiness formlessness, void. And that is because the consciousness has become afflicted by the void due to turning the attention away from God. So that is called Bahimuk, to turn the attention away from God. So the other direction is called the Unmuk, Krishna Unmuk, to turn the attention towards God. As the attention is turning towards Sri Krishna, then automatically, just as you see shadows when you have the back to the sun, when you turn towards the sun, you don't see shadows and your vision is clear. So similarly, when the consciousness turns towards Sri Krishna, automatically the above, the absence of awareness is removed and one becomes fully enlightened. And so, this process of shifting the consciousness from the aversion, aversion to the Supreme Being, and focusing the consciousness fully on the totality of existence, the root of existence, the Supreme Consciousness, the soul of our soul. Mm -hmm. This process of shift from the material consciousness to the spiritual consciousness, this is called Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga. The Yoga of Devotion. Why? Because we can only think of something we can only be absorbed in something all the time that we have love for. Mm -hmm. You can be absorbed in your mm, family, your children. Whatever. Why? Because you have love for them. So unless we have love for the Supreme Lord, we cannot be absorbed in Him. 
So bhakti is the process of developing that transcendental love. Now, just as the sun can only be seen by the power of the light coming from the sun, so similarly, the energy by which one can see God comes from God Himself. You know, if the sun is set, and you go out at night looking for the sun with your torch, you'll not find it. No one can find the sun on the basis of their own power. So when we believe in our own power, that is called arohapanta. Arohapanta, the ascending process. The, the aggressive mentality of self-elevationism. And this is what gives us all stress. The reason that we feel stress is because we have a tension and aggression in our mind by which we think, I have to figure out everything by myself. I have to plan for my own safety and security at every moment as I find myself in a hostile environment. And so this aggressive mentality by which we try to control and manipulate the environment that we experience around us. This is a great problem. This is the cause of our anxiety. And so one should give up the arohapanta, the path of self-elevationism. And just as a person just has to look to the east and wait for the sun to rise, then we have to look to the east. Look to India. There the sun has risen of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Vedic literatures. Look there in that direction and be patient. And when the sun of Sri Krishna, the Supreme Lord, rises, then the energy emanating from him fills our heart, that is bhakti. So God can only be seen by his own power. So when we speak of bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion, we're not speaking about something. That is within our power. But we're speaking about something that comes down to us. We simply have to give up the aggressive mentality of exploiting the physical world and adopt a receptive posture. To adopt the attitude of receptivity towards God and especially because in our conditioned state we cannot with material eyes see the Supreme Lord. But see, Krishna is so kind, he sends his representatives, the pure devotees, into this world. So we turn our attention towards the Guru, the spiritual master. And here, very, very carefully, very patiently, very attentively. This hearing process is the, of all the angas, the practices of bhakti, the first one is sravanam, hearing. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> <laughs> so, when I say, did you hear what I said, then this hearing and the hearing that I'm talking about are not necessarily the same thing. In Bhagavad Gita, there see Krishna said, Arjun asked him about divine knowledge. Where does it come from? See, Krishna said, Aham vivasvate yogam praktavan aham avayam vivasvan manave praha mano ikshvakave pravit. I spoke this knowledge uh, millions of years ago. Krishna is saying, I spoke it directly to vivasvan. And Vivasvan spoke this knowledge, Vivasvan Manave Pra to Manu. And Manu spoke to Ikshvaku. He gives the history of how the knowledge of yoga descends. Evam parampara praptam, imam rajasho vidu sakalainaha mahata, yogo nashta parantapa. He said, in this way, that is called parampara, from one spiritual master to his disciple. Then this disciple becomes the spiritual master for the next generation and he speaks to his disciple like this and gradually the knowledge comes down. So this is uh, commonly known 
anyone who has just a little familiarity with the Bhagavad Gita understands this. But the point we want to make here is this, that this speaking and hearing process is not like the speaking and hearing process that we are accustomed to in this physical realm. Hmm? You know the game Chinese whispers? <laughs> yeah? There's a group of people, they all sit in a circle and one whispers something in the ear of the other one quickly and then he has to pass it and it goes around. By the time it comes back to him, it's something completely different. Uh -huh. I remember when I was a boy in, my, in a history lesson. So then the history teacher, it was about the, the First World War. So there was trench warfare going on and uh, the communication lines were broken. So then some, one soldier at the front, he told a runner, a messenger, you know, the messengers, they have to get up out of the trenches and run back. And like this, told the runner, oh, you just send reinforcements. We're going to advance. Hmm? Send reinforcements. We're going to advance. <laughs> the bombs are going, what do you say? The bombs are going, I was, okay, okay, I've got it. And he got up and he ran, he ran to the next, down to the next trench and he dropped there. And he told us, the next runner there, the message, the runner, I've got it. And he got up and then he ran back to the next line like this. And in this way, so many soldiers were going. Each one was risking their life to carry the message to uh, the command in the rear, the rear command. And so the last runner went, got there and said, send three and four pence. We're going to a dance. <laughs> <laughs> three shillings and four pence. It was English money at that time. <laughs> So, this is the nature of hearing, speaking and hearing in the general life. That there's every possibility that when you speak, the other person won't understand what you said. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to very complex theological and philosophical points, we find that in many traditions, after a few generations, there are so many schisms. And because... Everyone has a different opinion of what the previous generation was trying to express. It's very complicated. So this happens all the time in traditions. So when Sri Krishna speaks about the parampara or the channel by which transcendental knowledge descends into this world, he's, when he says speaking and hearing, praktavan ahamaveyam, I spoke this. And another person heard and passed it on. He's not speaking about the hearing and the speaking with which we are accustomed. So that point has been cleared at the end of the Bhagavad Gita. In the end of the Bhagavad Gita, after giving, describing different aspects of transcendental knowledge, there see Krishna, he asks a question to Arjun. Kachit echat shutam pata tuagri did you hear what I said? Twayeka grain a chaitasa with a kagrata chitta. It's a completely different thing. Ekagrata chitta. What does that mean? The basic fabric of our psychological body, the basic fabric of our uh, mental, our mental stuff, is called the chitta. So, whatever feelings we have, whatever ideas and concepts and perceptions we have, these are all vrittis, they're just waves in the mind stuff, in the chitta. So for the general person, the chitta is very turbulent, right? See, for one minute the person is laughing, and the next minute they're crying. One minute they're really friendly, and the next minute they get angry. Right? So for the general persons, the chitta is quite turbulent and, and unstable. So in that condition, we cannot get a high-resolution uh, reflection of the world. Just like in water, if water is still, it will give a clear reflection of the world. But if water is oscillating, 
then the, the uh, reflection distorts everything. So in the same way, because we perceive everything through our own mind, therefore, if our mind is in a state of oscillation, if our mind is turbulent, then we don't get a high fidelity impression of reality, but we get a distorted vision. And one aspect of that distortion is the identification with the physical body. That body identification is so powerful that the moment we fall asleep and begin to dream, now our mind makes another body and we think we're that body. Right? Have you ever had a body in your dream that was different to the one when you're awake? But you still thought it was you, right? That's, I can fly. This is great. Yeah. I can play piano or something Something in a dream. You do something that in real life you cannot do. But it's just, yeah. It's a... So we are prone, due to avidya, due to ignorance, we're prone to identify with whatever situation we find ourselves. So just as the dreaming state is not an, an eternal... A permanent reality, really, it is not our identity. So when we wake up, this is also not our permanent identity. So, now we're discussing this subject about hearing and ekagrata chitta. So when the chitta is oscillating, then we don't get a clear impression of reality. Therefore, in Gita, Krishna says, Samatvam Yoga Uchate. Yoga is called samatva, a state of mental equilibrium. If a person can be steady, having the same mood in victory and defeat, if you win or if you lose, if your mind is the same, then we can say one is in samatva, a state of equilibrium. If we have the same state of mind when someone praises us, as when someone criticizes us. You can, imagine, you can think back to experiences in your own life and see the effects of praise and criticism to see, do you hold the fort? Are we the same? Or do, do we become, respond in a state of duality? So if we're the same in loss and profit, if you're doing some business or something and your business is going well, then, then you walk like this. <laughs> <laughs> and if your business is going through the floor and you, you're up to here in debt, then how do you feel? Serotonin levels are going down. <laughs> uh -huh. The self-confidence and everything is being shaken. And so much doubt, self-doubt comes like this. So, okay, anyone who is affected positively or negatively by life, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, they're not yogis. They're not yogis. Because see, Krishna is explaining, samatvam yoga uchate, yoga is the state of equilibrium. So when the mind is in equilibrium, and I must say that in, in, in India, the equilibrium for the general person is attained through dharma. Dharma means religion. It specifically means the performance of duties in life. Everyone is born in a particular situation. And so we all have some responsibilities related to the world. So if a person can follow their dharma, that means discharge their duties to their family, to society, to, to the brahmanas, to the priests and the intellectuals of the culture, then by this, gradually one develops what is called Satogun, the mode of goodness. And that mode of goodness is the state of equilibrium. In other words, we become free from rajas, we become free from passion, and free from ignorance, from laziness, and the mental inertia. So, really, what is called all over the world religion, or what is called all over the world ethics, or what is called all over the world the morality or integrity, is facing the problems of life and doing the right thing. And if someone does that all the time consistently for many years, the rajas, the passion begins to go away, and their mind begins to be steady and begin to, it begins to become uh, luminous. 
the consciousness becomes luminous, shining. So you can see a pious, a religious, a ethical, moral person. Their face is shining, their eyes are shining. And similarly, you can see a person who is just living an unprincipled and unruly life, taking intoxication, uh, doing, going against the uh, natural dharma and ethics, the universal ethics. You can see their faces become dark, their eyes are lifeless. So, Krishna is asking Arjun, Toika Grena Chaitasa, did you hear what I said? with one-pointed attention. Now, Ekagrata is a specific stage. According to the philosophy of yoga, there are on the spectrum of the psychological oscillations. There are five stages. First is the mudha. Mudha means your, the mind is in ignorance and inertia, inertia. Like a person who was drinking and then the next morning they wake up, uh, the mental functions are just slow. So that is the, the tamagun, the mode of ignorance. Then there is the kshipta. Kshipta means the mind is very active. Hmm? That person now, he just made it to the coffee machine. <laughs> and then took some coffee and now he's racing. The caffeine is going through his veins. <laughs> and he's ready for action. Hmm? <laughs> or worse than that even so now the person somehow he's stimulated but he cannot concentrate the mind is jumping from here to there here to there he's watching TV and having on two phones at the same time and like this the mind is jumping jumping like a grasshopper from place to place without any focus so that is chipta now if a person wants to achieve something in life, they'll have to concentrate. So if a person develops the power of concentration, if someone needs to study a subject or do some research into any profound subject, they'll have to concentrate so much with a, with a disturbed mind, with an agitated mind. Education, it's not possible for educa education to go on. Uh, I think this is a big challenge for young people today. That uh, they're trying to be educated, but there are so many distractions everywhere. And they cannot unplug. And so it makes a great uh, obstacle. Because to learn, to grow, you really have to concentrate and absorb things in layers, one after another, to get the profound understanding of any material, only a material subject, by the Aroha Panta, by the process of self-elevation. Uh, so... That person is called Vikshipta, they have some concentration, but the mind is occasionally distracted. It's not fully steady. Then the next stage, the fourth stage is called Ekagrata. Ekagrata Chitta, one pointed. Now the mind is very, very highly sattvic, very luminous and very steady. There's a very slight oscillation, hardly any. That is called the state of Ekagrata. Now, Ekagrata is also a preliminary stage of trance. It's called Sampragyata Samadhi. Or it can be called Savikalpa Samadhi also. And then the last stage is the Nirvikalpa Samadhi. So, the preliminary state of trance is called Ekagrata. And this is what Krishna is asking to Arjun at the end of Bhagavad Gita. He said, did you hear what I was saying in the state of Ekagrata? And has your illusion and ignorance been dispelled? And there's a reason for this. Because the impressions in our mind that make us like an animal. You know, an animal thinks, a cat thinks, I'm a cat. A dog thinks, I'm a dog. Put the dog and the cat together. I say, you're not a dog. But he'll still run after the cat. He cannot, and he has no capacity to understand. So, when our consciousness is oscillating, then we have 
that animalistic side to us. It's a complete avesh. That means absorption in the flesh. Absorption in the flesh. Avesh. Abini vesh. Avidya asmita rag dvesh abini vesh. This absorption in the bodily identity. It's, a, it's, a re it's not really a human. It's the remnant of our previous lives in the other species. In the lower species. And now we've come to the human level. But we still have a remnant of that base instinct. Which is not really the expression of humanity. Hmm? So the, ex the thing that makes the human different from the animal is dharma. That he thinks, yes, I am in a contaminated and corrupt situation. And I have to accept in my life difficulties. Hmm? Nowadays the mentality is life is to feel good. Hmm? But the more you just try to feel good all the time then the more you'll have to rely on pills, happy pills. <laughs> because there's no values in this. The actual true values of life and all the religions of the world, they say that this human life is for penance. We're in a, we're in a corrupt state, so we accept suffering. And that by that suffering, it's not something that's immoral or bad. This is the nihilistic mentality today that suffering is bad. Only some type of constant stimulation and dopamine rush is morally good. The dopamine rush is morally good, but suffering is morally bad. But this is wrong. Suffering is also fine. Happiness and distress, we should see them the same. But we accept the distress as something positive. Why? Because by undergoing the uh, dependence and the difficulties of life, our consciousness becomes, there's a restoration of our consciousness from its animalistic state. The animal is searching always to taste, to taste, to taste something. And so by accepting suffering in our life, our consciousness becomes restored from the base animalistic instinct. And therefore, a true spiritual person embraces problems. Kunti Devi said, Vipadasanta Yasha Swat Tatra Tatra Jagad Guru. Oh Krishna, now the war is over and everything is fine and you're leaving. Oh, I am praying, Krishna, send me more problems in my life. I want more problems. I embrace those problems. Because when I'm in difficulty, at that time I always remember you. And anyone who always remembers you will become free from the cycle of birth and death. In other words, their soul will be reformed, it will be restored, and they will transcend this world. Hmm? So, we should not be afraid of difficulties or problems in our life. We face them enthusiastically, embrace them with a smile. Hmm? And they will uh, help to restore us. And so, this restoration is the brings one to sattva -gun. when the consciousness is in sattva -gun, when it's steady, you can experience ekagrata. And this is what Krishna is speaking about. Hey Arjun, did you hear with Tvaya ekagrata Chaitasa, with complete equilibrium of your consciousness? And has your illusion been removed? And the reason is this. The quality of the chitta, See, Kapil Dev has taught to his mother Devahuti, we were discussing last week in Venice, uh, that Svachatvam avakaritvam Santatvam iti chaitasa The characteristics of the pure chitta, the steady chitta, the first one is called Svachatva. It, uh, it means clarity, but especially our acharyas have commented it means bhagavad bimba grahitvam the power to catch the reflection of the form of god in other words krishna is saying did you listen with one pointed attention and was your ignorance removed by realizing god this is actually because the darkness can only re cannot be you cannot remove darkness if you're in a dark room and you think, oh, I'm going to get all this darkness and throw it out. That will not work. 
can't put all the darkness in a bag and get rid of it. You have to just introduce light and the darkness goes away. And so what, essentially what Krishna is saying, that in bhakti, hearing means hearing with a kagrata chitta, with one-pointed attention. And when a disciple, a shishya, shishya means disciple, is under discipline, he's accepted the difficulties. Guru has told him, do this, do this, do this. And accepting all problems and difficulties. He has done that and he's become restored to the state of Ekagrata Chitta. And when he sits in front of his spiritual master and the spiritual master speaks, then this sound is not even material sound. Tasmin Mahan Mukarita Marubic Charitra. The Guru who is realizing Krishna in his heart, the beautiful form of Krishna, the pastimes and qualities of Krishna are transformed and take, they become Mukarita. Madhubich Charitra means the pastimes of God take the form of sound. They emanate from the lips of Sri Guru and when, then when the disciple hears, then that uh, sound touches the heart and is reconstituted, is prakashit, manifested there. So it's not like send reinforcements, we're going to advance and then become send three and four points, we're going to advance. But rather, the beauty of the spiritual world turns into Shabda Brahma, transcendental sound, travels, goes into the ear of the disciple and the spiritual world manifests there. So there's no question of misunderstanding, there's no question of confusion, there's no question of a schism, because a, a description was not imparted, but the actual vastu, the actual substance itself was the experience of the divine substance was imparted directly. And this is evam parampara praptam imam raja shayo vidhu. Huh? Understand now what it means? The first anger of bhakti is hearing, but not hearing like I just heard a car go past outside. Not that hearing, this hearing. Hmm? So when Arjun heard these words from Krishna, he said, Nasto moha shmiti labda. My bewilderment has gone and I have attained smriti. Smriti. Now generally people say smriti means remembrance. But smriti means the chinta, the direct experience of God in the state of contemplation. You cannot remember something that you have not experienced. So a person who has not experienced God cannot remember God. They can only remember the samskars, the impressions of their previous activities. As Narad Rishi has said, Sadatsvanabhutato Namanas prastum ahati, you should take it from me. That the mind can never touch anything that it hasn't experienced before. That means that anything that you can think of in your mind is either some experience you had in this life or a previous life or a collage of those experiences. Uh, you can imagine a flying elephant. Why? Because you saw a bird, you saw an elephant and you mix the samskars together and now. But if you've never seen an elephant and you've never seen a bird, then you could not imagine it. So the mind cannot touch anything it has an experience. So how can one remember God? And this is why the angas of bhakti begin shravanam. First here, because that gives the experience. Then kirtanam. And then when you do kirtan, then you have a darshan in the heart and that's called smaranam. The darshan in the heart is called smaranam. So hearing is darshan, chanting is darshan, remembering is darshan. Because bhakti, as we described earlier, is the God's own energy and it has two aspects, samvit and ladini. Samvit shakti is awareness, consciousness of spiritual existence. And ladini is joy. So when a person engages in hearing, it is not a material hearing, but it is God's energy of consciousness and joy entering into the ear and empowering us to see that which is beyond this world. When a person is chanting, it is the God's energy of consciousness and joy manifesting on the tongue. 
and coming out in the form of beautiful sun, hmm? which makes a vritti in the consciousness hmm, of realization of Krishna. Avir bhuya mano brito tatsu vrajanti tatsu rupatam. See, like Rupa Goswami Pad said, what is bhav, emotion, emotional love for God? It is when, just as God makes an avatar and descends to this world, it is when Sambit and Ladini, the energy of consciousness and joy, does an avatar and enters into your chitta and takes over them and becomes one with them. So you're thinking, these are my thoughts, but these are not your thoughts. This is a transmission from the divine realm. That is Smaranam. So, in Bhakti, we're using the same words that other people are using, but the meanings are actually different. The meaning of an ignorant person, how he experiences the word, that is called Agyuru Divriti. The, the meaning of words as they're perceived by an educated person, a PhD, a linguist, a, a grammarian, Sanskritologist, uh, that is called Sadharan Rudibriti. It is ordinary understanding. But the understanding of words of the devotee is called Vidvat Rudibriti. The experience of the Vidvan, one who is in full knowledge. And in Vidvat Rudibriti, hearing means darshan. Tvam bhakti yoga paribhavita rit saroja asai shrutekshita patha nanunata punksa. Shrutekshita patha. That means bhakti is the path of seeing through the ears. And not only seeing. Ye tu tu diya charnambu jakosha gandam jigranti karna vivarai shruti vartanita. In Bhagavatam he said, Oh my Lord, your pure devotee, smell the fragrance of your lotus feet through the ear. So the hearing process is a complete experience. It's not only seeing Krishna, smelling the sweet fragrance of Krishna, hearing the flute of Krishna. This is hearing in Bhakti. And this is what has been expressed in Bhagavad Gita. But if we try by ourselves just to study Bhagavad Gita, we'll take the Agyurudhi Briti, we may take the Sadharan Rudhi Briti, but we'll only take the Vidvat Rudhi Briti, the actual meaning, when we hear from the lips, live, in Sadhu Sangha, in the association of a pure devotee, otherwise not. Independent study, Independent academic study of Vedic scripture will give nothing. Hmm? The Vedas, another name for the Vedas is Sruti. Sruti means that which is heard. It must be heard. And it cannot be heard from a person who doesn't have realization. Because if a person has no realization in their heart, how will it become the Shabda Brahma coming from their lips? So it's very important to take shelter of a qualified guru and hear very carefully. And go on hearing until your mind has come to the state of Ekagrata Chitta. Steadiness and then the hearing becomes direct experience. But, so Krishna said, Sradhavan Bhajate, sorry, Sradhavan Labhate Jnanam. Someone who has faith in this path, who applies himself in, through all difficulties, accepting the uh, making sacrifice in their life for the sake of attaining divine knowledge. So, Sraddhavan Labhate Gyanam, he will get direct realization. But Sangsayatta Vinashati, those persons who have doubt, then they're ruined. They cannot receive the transcendental knowledge. You know, Vyasadev, who has compiled the Bhagavad Gita, he has uh, four main disciples, and he entrusted each disciple with one of the Vedas. The Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajo Veda, and Atarava Veda. So, one of his disciples is the Jaimini Rishi. So, one day, Srila Vyasadeva was speaking, and his disciple, Jaimini Rishi, was writing down. He was taking dictation from his guru. Vyasadeva said, Matra Swasra Duhitra Va Na Vivektayasano Bhavet. Balavan Indriya Gramo Vidrangsam Apikarshati. Those who are Dharmic in Vedic culture, one should not sit down alone in a solitary place with a woman 
even your own mother, your own sister or your own daughter. And a very extreme point is put on it. So what to speak of anyone you met in the street or... Hmm? So an extreme point is put it, so you cannot make an excuse. Don't, a male person or a female person should not sit down alone with anyone. Why is this? Because Balavan Indriya Gramo, our senses are very strong. You may think I have self-control. I have the power of restraint. I have tolerance. But the senses are very strong. Very, very strong. How strong? Vyasadeh said, Bidvangsam apikarshati. They can attract and pull even Bidvangsam, a very learned person. So, when Jaimini Rishi was listening to this, he was writing it down. Balavan, very strong. Indriya, Gramo, all the, the group of the senses, the very strong. Vidvangsan, a learned person. Apikashati, even they can catch the learned person. And he heard that, he thought, or oh, maybe I misheard him. I think I misheard him. What did he say, Vidvangsam? Napikashati, that's right, that sounds right. Vidvangsam <laughs> Napikashati. Hmm? The senses are very powerful, but they cannot catch a very learned person like me. <laughs> hmm? Jaimini Rishi was thinking, I'm a learned person. Eh? If I sit down with my mother or sister or anyone or any woman, it will not affect me. I have Ekagwarta Jitta. I am in Sahaj Samadhi, natural trance. I cannot go in Maya. I cannot be caught by illusion. I know I am not this body. And everyone else, they are also not their body. So he thought, what did Gurudev say? Vidvansam Apikash? No, Vidvansam Napikashati. The senses are very powerful, but they cannot attract the mind of a learned person. Learned person. <laughs> Pride is deadly. Vanity is deadly. This pure saint, he never relies on his own strength. He feels, I am weak. I am vulnerable at every moment. He never points a finger and criticizes someone else also, who is the, in the becoming attached or whatever. He cannot criticize anyone because he feels, oh, who am I to say anything about this person? I don't know for how long I can maintain my own integrity. So he has compassion? Ha 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 ha, no. He has compassion for others when they're going through difficulties. Because he thinks, oh, that could be me. Huh? So vanity is a great folly. It is the beginning of the end. So now, Jaimini Rishi, he wrote, Vidvangsam, Apika, no, no, Napikashati, a learned person cannot be attracted. After some time, he was alone and he was in his bhajan kutir. He had a, a hut in the forest. It was winter time. It was very cold. And he lit a fire in the middle of his hut. And smoke was going out through the top. And outside there was a raging storm. Thunder, lightning and heavy rain. Very, very cold. And he was sitting there. And he was meditating, and sometimes studying, studying the Vedas. Hmm? After some time, there was a knock on the door. So who is that? At this time of night? He got up and opened the door, and there he saw one young woman, completely soaked through. Her cloth, everything was soaked through. She was shivering and freezing cold. Huh? She said, oh, I have been caught in a storm. I cannot find shelter anywhere. Hmm? She said, don't be distressed, my dear daughter, because in Vedic culture, anyone who's younger than you, treat like a daughter. Same age, you treat like a sister. An older woman, you treat like a mother. My dear daughter, don't fear. You come inside. And then she came inside. And uh, you can uh, warm yourself by the fire. So then she went by the fire. And then he went and he's in another part of the hut and he sat down and he was meditating. So all her clothes were wet and cold, everything. So she thought I should dry them. So then she began to take off her clothes. 
mm-hmm. and hang them by the fire and he was meditating <laughs> oh <laughs> huh? But he was not meditating, he was looking. Huh? What's going on? She was very attractive, very beautiful, and her body was illuminated by the reddish flames of the fire. And by this, his heart became inflamed. Hmm? And then he got up and he approached her. And he said, uh, <laughs> "It would be very good if we could, uh, we should unite. We should be united here and this beautiful night next to this beautiful fire. It's so romantic." She said, "What? We are not married. How is it possible?" Hmm? He said, "Well, I'm a rishi. I'm a sage." I'm a Brahmin, I can do the uh, wedding ceremony. <laughs> she said, you, oh, yeah, well, that's true, you can, that's right, you can. So um, that means we have to go around the fire seven times, right? In the wedding ceremony, you have to, the, the, the wife and the, the bride and the bridegroom, they have to walk around the fire seven times uh, in an anti-clockwise direction. Because clockwise indicates liberation. When you circumambulate the temple or you circumambulate Tulsi, you go in a clockwise direction because it indicates becoming liberated from this world. And when you get married, you have to go around the fire seven times in the anti-clockwise direction because it indicates that you will be trapped in this world and those two souls will be bound together for seven lifetimes. So... So then she agreed, she said, uh, oh, all right, if you, if you can do the ceremony. And, and so he was so lusty, he couldn't wait. And he just grabbed her and picked her up and started running around the fire. <laughs> <laughs> so now Jai Rini Rishi, she, he lifted her on his shoulder like this and he was running around the, running around the fire one time, <laughs> two times, <laughs> three times, four times. And she started hitting him on the head. <laughs> and she was saying, Bidvang Sam Apikashati. Bidvang Sam Apikashati. Bidvang Sam Apikashati. Even a Bidwan, a very learned person, can lose control of his senses if he's not careful. When he was being hit on the head like this, and the words of his guru were coming now. Even his, yeah, yeah, Gurudev said, Vindvatsam Apikashati. Why did I change the words of Gurudev? Huh? Then he was so embarrassed. And he, before he could get seven times around the fire, he realized, Oh my God, I, I'm doing wrong. I've become lost. Because I didn't hear. I did not hear from Guru. And what I heard, I didn't believe. And I changed it. And now look what's happening to me. Everyone should know this. One must hear from Guru. If we don't hear or if, and we don't follow, disaster will come for sure. For sure. Hmm? And I'm not speaking about uh, only some philosophy. Anything Guru Dev tells. Every small thing. We should try to observe and follow it. So now he was old and he was being beaten on the head and now he was remembering that day when he was taking dictation from his spiritual master. And he felt so ashamed. And then he put, just put down the girl and he bowed his head in complete the, um, shame, in complete embarrassment. He was filled with remorse. He felt so repent, such repentance. Then with a contrite heart, because now he has to face the girl and just apologize for his outrageous behavior. So with a contrite heart, he looked up and there was his Guru Vyasadev. Standing <laughs> <laughs> there. Vedvangsana Pikara Shati. Sakshad Ritvena Samasta Shastre. See, Guru is the external manifestation of God in the heart. And he can come anywhere, anytime, 
every time. Tamsara babuta ridayam munimana tosmi. Sutta Goswami said, I bow down to my Gurudev who is in the heart of every living entity and through anyone. He can instill a lesson and correct us even if we are humble enough to have that vision. So we have discussed the meaning of hearing and the dangers of not hearing. <laughs> See, Krishna the Supreme Lord is very kind. And in this age of Kali, He appears in the form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Apeni karimu bhakta bhava angikari apeni achari bhakti shikamu sabari. Krishna said, I will take the mood of a devotee and I will appear in the world and I will teach everyone how to practice bhakti by my own example. Yuga dharma pravataimu nama sankirtan chari bhava bhakti nachamu bhavan. I'll make the whole world dance, realizing the moods of love, four moods of love, as Krishna's servants, of Krishna's friends, parental love and romantic love, even, especially. Because unless a person practices something in his own, own life, he cannot teach others. We cannot be the Paropadesh Pandits. You know, Paropadesh Pandit means the scholar who is always telling others what to do, but is not practicing himself. Those words will not have any power to change others. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to this world, and as you know, after accepting sannyas, he went to Jagannath Puri, and then in Puri, he decided, I want to go to South India to search out Vishwarup. My brother who had taken sannyas some years earlier. So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was staying in Puri, at first he stayed in the home of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who was a very great scholar, but he was an impersonalist. He conceived of God as being just an empty light everywhere. But by the mercy of Mahaprabhu, he went beyond that light and saw that that light is emanating from a transcendental, eternal, spiritual form, most beautiful form of Sri Krishna. And now Sarvabhoma and the Bhattacharya had such love for Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu came to him, he said, I want to search out Vishwarup. So I want to go to South India. Please give me permission to go. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said, I can tolerate any difficulty in my life. I may die myself, I can tolerate it. Or even, even my children. If my son will die, I can tolerate it. But I cannot tolerate the separation from you. After many lifetimes, finally, by good fortune, I have your company. And now, by my misfortune, I will lose it again. Please, don't go. Stay for a few more days. You are independent, Supreme Lord. You can do as you like. But please, just stay for a few more days. So, because Supreme Lord, Aham Bhakta Paradi no Yashvatantra Ivadrija, Sri Krishna said, I am not independent. I am controlled by the love of my devotee. Everyone thinks God is Ishvara, the controller. It's true. But that Lord who is controlling the whole universe becomes controlled by the love in the heart of his devotee. So, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he stayed for four or five more days. And then, when it was time to go, he was leaving, and it's a custom, if there's a great personality, when they leave, you should follow them some distance. So Sarvabhom Bhattacharya was following him some distance, and then Mahaprabhu thought, you, this is enough, now you go back. Then Mahaprabhu turned, and he set off. And the, the bondage of love in the heart of Sarvabhom Bhattacharya was so strong, that as soon as Mahaprabhu left him, he... His consciousness left him. He fainted on the spot and fell to the ground. Just the shock of the separation. This is love. This is love. If a person is not feeling separation, at every moment, oh my Krishna, where are you? 
हा हा मोर प्रण दन हा हा पद्म लोचन हा हा दिव्य सदगुण सगर हा हा श्याम सुंदर हा हा पीतम बार दर हा हा रास विलासन गा पर्सन इज नॉट वीपिंग ओ कृष्ण यू आर माई प्राण Oh lotus eyed krishna where are you where are you the hero of the rasa dance then where is the bhakti so we see this in sarva bomba the chariya when chaitanya mahaprabhu was leaving at once he fainted but mahaprabhu he didn't even look back he didn't look back he just continued on his path this is something amazing in shastri said vajra dapi kathorani miduni kusumadapi lokotaranam chaitangsi kono vigyata mishwaraha it means that lokotaranam chaitangsi those persons whose hearts are lokotara they are above this world their consciousness has gone beyond the limitations of time beyond the limitations of space beyond the limitations of sense perception beyond the limitation of the mind and intelligence even lokotaranam chaitansi those persons vajra pikaturani they are harder than a thunderbolt and miduni kushmarapi softer than a rose usually a person is soft hearted or a person is very harsh but a transcendental person has these irreconcilable characteristics that sometimes they're as hard as a rock hard as stone hard as thunderbolt and sometimes they soft as a rose it seems they actually always soft but sometimes they have to manifest some harshness for our benefit it is for our benefit so mahapur left and he continued on his journey gradually as he was going through south to south india he arrived at one village called the kurmakshetra kurmakshetra because there was a temple there and in the temple there was a beautiful deity of karma dev the tortoise incarnation of the lord so mahapu went there and he was dancing and one brahman that brahman his name was also karma he invited mahapu please come and to stay in my home so mahapu came to the home of that brahman and by the mercy of mahapu that brahmin could realize oh this is krishna himself who has come to teach us bhakti by showing his own example so karma along with his whole family washed the feet of mahapu hmm? and they drank the charnamrita they offered food to mahapu and they took his remnant and karma gave it to all his family members and they served him very sweetly and thousands of people they were rushing there thousands of people were rushing there to see mahaprabhu chaitanya mahaprabhu and mahaprabhu was doing kirtan with thousands of people and the power of prem which was emanating from him it was so extraordinary emana dayala nahi shuni tribhubane krishna prem hoy yara dur darshane there was never anyone so merciful as chaitanya mahaprabhu why even those who would see him from far away they would become overwhelmed with prem hmm? navadweep sei shakti prakasha vela that power that mahaprabhu manifested in navadweep he did not manifest such power in navadweep as he manifested in the tour in south india why in navadweep at that time there are so many uh, smart brahmins following smriti shastra they were very fixed in their ways and they were very against devotion they were impersonalists and tantrics and others and so when he was there he did not give them mercy of course years later he went back and then to everyone he gave mercy to everyone but at that time when he was in navadweep such a mercy wasn't there but when he came to south india the waves of prem love were emanating from him and all were becoming mahabhagavat so it was so extraordinary 
the next morning, when Mahaprabhu was leaving that place, then that Brahmin Karma, he came to him and said, please take me with you. He wanted to leave his home, he wanted to leave his family, leave her and just go wherever Mahaprabhu was going, because that attachment had come. They couldn't leave him. Mahaprabhu said, don't think such a thing. You should stay here in your home. But I give you this instruction. Yare deke tahe kaha Krishna upadesh. Amara agyaya guru haya tare desh. Everyone you meet, you should tell them about Krishna. Tell them to chant the holy names and to follow the teachings of Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. On my order, become Acharya, become a guru and save everyone in your own land. Then he may say, but I am not qualified, how will I do it? Mapu said, Kabu na badibe tomar vishayataranga punapi eitai pavi morasanga. If you follow what I'm saying, even though you are living in your home and with your family, but the waves of vishay, the waves of sense gratification, they will not obstruct your progress. Tomar vishayataranga. You are happy in your family life with your wife and children. But if you speak about Krishna all the time to every person you meet, these uh, waves of the worldly experience, it will not touch you. And one more thing. I promise you that again you will have my association here. So Mahaprabhu didn't go back it seems. But it means that if someone will follow this teaching of Mahaprabhu, then Mahaprabhu will give his association to that person transcendentally. They will realize his beautiful golden form. Hmm? So after giving this instruction, Mahaprabhu set off. And that, that Brahmin, Karma Brahmin, he was just standing there crying and seeing Mahaprabhu walk off into the distance. In the meantime, nearby, there was another Brahmin. His name was... Uh, Basudev. So Basudev, he was very poor and he was also very ill. Hmm? And this happens to everyone, there's no avoiding it. At some point in your life, either today or tomorrow, you will have to face some extreme health challenges because it's the nature of the physical body. The Brahmin, the Basudev, he had an extreme health challenge. He had leprosy. He had opened wounds on his body. His flesh was being eaten away by the disease. And a very bad smell was coming from his body. He couldn't live in the village. If someone saw him, they would run away. He was all alone. He was ostracized, rejected from society. There were even worms living in his open wounds. But he was a devotee of Krishna. So because of his transcendental consciousness, he was not affected by the worldly embodiment. Hmm? Now you may experience being embodied, but a person whose consciousness is pure, they don't have the embodied experience. So he was a happy person. He was always chanting it joyfully. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, 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 Rama. With the Japa Mala, with the rosary, he used to chant the holy names joyfully. And when he was chanting, sometimes when he moved, a worm, a maggot that was in his open wound would fall out of his body. And then he would think, oh and pick him up and put him back. Did you hear what I said? Really, hear it. Hear it. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Atmopam yena sabatra samam pashati sorjuna sukam vaya divadukam sa yogi paramo mata Who is the parama yogi, the greatest yogi? Krishna is saying, that person who by comparison with his own self sees all others to be equal to him. Hmm? 
He is the greatest yogi. This is a problem. Our consciousness is such. The worldly consciousness is it is the always engaged in act of measurement. Miyate anaya iti maya. Maya means by which measurement is done. So as long as our mind is trying to measure everything around us, then we are in illusion. Hmm? Oh, we see some food. Oh, we want to measure. How sweet is it? How crunchy is it? How salty is it? The senses want to measure everything. And especially we like to measure other people. Looking always, is this person more strong than me? More beautiful than me? More educated than me? More popular than me or less? If it's more, then we feel some disturbance. If it's less, we feel proud. And so the mind is oscillating through the acts of measuring everything around us all the time. This is illusion. So the sign that someone is free from illusion, that person who sees, I'm a soul, and you're a soul, and you're a soul, and we're all souls. Just as the photons emanate from the sun are all the same. So in the same way, we souls are like photons of spiritual energy who have come from God. I am not greater than you, you are not greater than me. A person with pure vision has no envy to others. He says, all souls are just like me. But more than that, Sukam vaya diva dukam sayogi paramomata. In the other person's happiness and in their distress, he sees equality. That means that a yogi is that person who feels the happiness and the distress of others to be his own. So when we see another person suffering, the yogi will feel that suffering and be overwhelmed with compassion. When he sees a person becoming successful in their spiritual life then he'll become joyful if he sees the person happy enjoying then he feels suffering because for the yogi happiness is suffering hmm? Patanjali has said in the yoga sutras that the yogi he sees even the enjoyment of the people of the world is pure pain everything is pain because the more you try to enjoy the physical body, you more become attached to it. The more you're attached to it, the more you have to go in the cycle of birth and death, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. So the so-called happiness, even, is pain. So it is said, the, the, the vision of the yogi sees the world is like an ocean of pain. Because he's very sensitive. If dust is in the air, the dust may land on your arm, on your head, on your leg. No effect. But if the dust lands in your eye, then you feel it. So the general people, they're like the rest of the body. They see happiness, they see distress. But the yogi, he's very sensitive. And he feels the pain of other souls. And he wants to help them. Vaishnava Thakura, Aprakritasada, Nirdosha Anandamoy. Sadhaname Ruchi, Jada Udasina, Jivete Doya Drahoi, Sila Bhaktinota Kor. He said, the saint is such a person. They are transcendental and full of spiritual joy. They have no worldly faults. They feel taste, always relishing the holy name. And they are quite Udasin, that means completely indifferent to the pleasures of the world. But they are not indifferent to the sufferings of others. Their hearts are always melting in compassion for the suffering of others. So this is the nature of the saint. And this is why that Brahmin who had leprosy, if a maggot would fall from a wound in his body, you think, oh, now he's lost his home, his family and his food and everything and put him back. Back into the world. It's an extreme example. But this scripture is manifesting these examples to make the deep sanskar on us by which we can be transformed from our corrupted state to the pure state and conform ourselves to the lives of the saints. So that Brahmin suffering from leprosy, 
But in his heart, happy, always remembering Krishna, the news came to him. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is staying in the house of the Brahmin named uh, the Kurma. So when he heard this, he got up and he set out. But because he was very ill, he could only walk very slowly. And when he arrived there, there was a big crowd of people around the house. And people moved out of his way. And when he got there, then he said, where is Chaitanya Mahapu? Oh, he's left. The Brahmin, the Kurma was there crying because Mahapu had just left. And then when Basudev, that lame leper, heard that he'd missed his chance to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He cried out, Oh, see Krishna Chaitanya. And he fainted, he fell to the ground. Now Mahaprabhu is very tall and walking with big paces and he was quite far away. But the moment that Brahmin called out, see Krishna Chaitanya. Shri Krishna Chaitanya. Because he called out with a pure heart full of love. Though Mahaprabhu was apparently far away, he heard it and immediately turned around. He immediately turned around and was marching back where he came from. Back towards the house of the Karma, the Brahmin. And as he was approaching there, he saw Vasudev. It weeping and sitting on the ground and Mapu just came up and picked him up and embraced him tightly. Basudev was crying. He was a great scholar of Srimad Bhagavatam which is full of the nectar of Krishna's pastimes and as soon as he was embraced by Mahaprabhu then a verse of Srimad Bhagavatam came from his heart. Kvaham Daridra Papiyan Kwa Krishna Shuni Ketama Brahma Bandhu Itis Maham Bahu Byam Pariram Bitaha. Once there was a, a Brahmin named Sudama and he traveled to meet with Krishna in the fabulous city of Dwarka. And when he got there, see Krishna, he was he was very, very poor, but Krishna embraced him. At that time he said, Oh Krishna, who am I? I am just a sinful person. I'm not even a Brahmin, I'm a Brahma Bandhu. That's a polite way of saying a Brahmin who is not really qualified to be a Brahmin, a priest who doesn't really, isn't very educated, is a Brahma Bandhu, a friend of a Brahmin. That means he's not qualified. He said, I'm, like, I'm a Brahma Bandhu. I'm not qualified even to be a Brahmin. And I'm a sin, sinful person. And who are you? You are Sri Krishna Srini Gaitana. You are the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna. The object of the worship of the goddess of fortune Lakshmi Devi herself is always serving your lotus feet and even though in this world no one comes near from me near to me everyone is repelled by my the repugnant looks and my obnoxious smell but you have come and you have embraced me so by the transcendental touch of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu then that Brahman, Basudev, he was completely healed. Not only was he, his body completely healed, but he became very young and healthy and handsome. And everyone there saw what a mir miraculous transformation had taken place by the embrace of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And now his leprosy was cured. He became young and healthy again and he felt some sadness. He said, my Lord, it would be better if you could give me back my leprosy because now I may become proud that I am healthy, strong and handsome. And if I become proud, they will forget you and that will be the worst thing. I always used to remember you, but now I am in great danger. Mahaprabhu said, no, I will not return that leprosy. But I want to give you something. If you will follow this, you will never be touched by pride. Amane 
कीर्तनिया सदा हरि कीर्तनिया सदा हरि continuously always at every moment chant the holy names of sri krishna why because to chant continuously requires to know the peace we need not to have such a temperament wherein one considers oneself to be more insignificant than a worthless piece of straw it requires such a temperament that one is more tolerant than a tree more generous and charitable than a tree if a tree is standing in the blazing hot sun at the same time he gives shade to others if anyone wants fruit leaves wood from the tree he just gives without resistance so only a person who is as generous and liberal and gracious as a tree and who is more humble than a blade of grass who gives respect to everyone without demanding respect for himself only such a person is capable of chanting the holy name of the lord continuously so continue chanting all the time and you will not be touched by pride so after receiving these instructions then that brahman Vasudev he was tears were flowing from his eyes as he was realizing Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is none other than Brajendra Nandan Shama Sundar Krishna himself of Vrindavan and standing next to him was Karma the other brahmin whose house it was and he was crying also and Mahaprabhu turned his back on both of them and left because love has two parts sambhog and vipalamba meeting and separation they experience the meeting milan now they're experiencing beraha separation mapu immediately left bosudev and karma they were weeping and they just looked at each other and they embraced each other we have lost mapu but at least we have each other sadhu sang the only solace for the saint who's feeling separation from the lord the only solace is other saints param puj pal sila bhakti rachak shida maharaj has written a very beautiful poem about sri sri gaur gadadhar that just as if there's a friend let's say there's a one you have a friend and he's really really down on his luck not you but general people really really down on his luck he is completely depressed so then his friend will come to visit him and what does he bring <laughs> what chocolate chocolate uh uh-huh. well that's your friends <laughs> actually when i said this once in russia and they immediately knew <laughs> <laughs> yes, as you bring a drink. My dear, have a drink of this. You'll feel better. <laughs> and so the friend comes to his friend who's really depressed and gives him a drink and he, he drinks away his sorrows. Hmm? It numbs his consciousness and he tries to drink away his sorrows. So in the same way, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a broken-hearted in separation from Sri Krishna, kahara kohi boke bo jane mura duka prajendra nanda nabinu phate mura boka to whom can i speak and who can understand the extent of my disappointment without krishna the son of nandamaj my heart is broken so when chaitanya mahapu was crying like this then gadarda being his closest friend came and gave him the very strong drink of hari katar of shrimad bhagavata and mapu used to drink this and become intoxicated so the only solace in separation from sri krishna for the saints in this world is the company of other saints and in that company satam prasangan mama virya sambido bhavanti ritkana rasayana katha the discussion of krishna's pastimes this is really rasayan this is really the tonic that gives life and health So in this way this evening we have tried to touch on some very 
basic ideas of Bhagavad Gita, how transcendental knowledge descends by hearing, and by hearing I mean vidvatrudi, meaning of hearing, not the general meaning of hearing. We have spoke about the consequences of not hearing transcendental knowledge correctly from the Guru. And we have spoke also about the qualities of saints, their humility, their tolerance, their compassion for others, and their taste in so the holy association. My Gurudev, even when he was 90 years old and considered the highest saint on the planet, one day I was in his room alone and he was chanting and he just looked at me with tears in his eyes he said a prayer i want sadhu sang mm. so the final topic is the importance of the aso holy association without holy association we cannot be transformed we cannot hear so this is very important i invite everyone please join us we have a big festival next week in Latvia and then the week after that in what? In Russia and then the week after that in Spain, in Sevilla, in Spain. And then we're going back to our ashram in India. So in the month of Kartik, then for one whole month we'll have a pilgrimage in the holy land of Sri Krishna, which has intense power, intense transformational power, that holy place. And there's very holy association there as well. So I invite everyone, if it's possible, please come. If it's not possible, don't worry, just come anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and spend one month in the, in, in the holy place, hearing, chanting, remembering in holy association. Gaur Premanande! Hari Hari Bo!